Shalom, and welcome to another edition, another episode here on the Genesis 49ers page, and today we're going to actually cover a topic pertaining to the Genesis 49ers, if you don't know why my name, or why I chose that name, or um, entity, if you will, title for that entity, if you will, Genesis 49ers represents Genesis 49 in the Bible, and that's what we base our belief in our our uh, understanding, our science, and our wisdom on Genesis 49, that we know who the tribes are to the, uh, to this day in the modern times. And uh, that's why I named the page Genesis 49ers, like the football team. Uh, but as you can see on your page, across seas, the Israelites migrated via ships. Um, like I said, this was a hot topic last year and the year before, 12 tribe chart. Oh, you guys can't prove it. Uh, my other channel, I did many videos on this subject, on this topic, touching on the ships, touching on that they were Negroes first, touching on uh, a lot of the histories that coincide with this proof, with these proofs and evidences. So, with no further more ado, let's commence Cross Seas. First slide. It says, we, uh, right now I'm trying to master my... Spanish, so I just implemented that. You can ignore that if you want. Uh, but what we want to pay attention to is the source right here. You know, my page, I deal with a lot of sources because a lot of the people on the other hand that are con contra or contra or against the 12 tribe chart, against our people as a whole, they lack sources they lack source material they lack legitimate sources you see what i'm saying uh, all of their attacks are basically rhetoric or uh, how they feel or you know oh all 12 tribes are black well we understand we come from a dark nation that doesn't mean all of us are pigmented and melanated in the skin some of our some of our people are clean leopards leviticus the 13th chapter talks about that okay they come with these uh, mundane arguments that really don't equal up to anything. What I try to do on my channel is to provide you concrete proof, a foundation that you can actually go back and teach other people um, this, and it will be reputable and clearly clear and concise for the politity and for the layman. With that being said, with that being stated and out of the way, let's begin. So as you can see on your screen. It says, uh, what other connections do the mending people or the mending people have to the Americas? Pause. Sidebar. These people also were sold as slaves to Mexico, 200,000 to be exact. So not only they were ancient relatives of the Olmec, but they also were sold as slaves later uh, in the transatlantic slave trade to Mexico. Why? Because Proverbs 20 verse 24 says, the goings of man are of the Lord. You know, he's going to bring you to where your brothers are. Uh, but anyway, it says the Olmec, Munding, and America's Al 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 Algonquian have several things in common. The first commonality is that they both claim to have come to the Americas from across the sea from the east. Let me read that again. The first commonality is that they both claim to come to the Americas from across the sea from the east. They originate in the Orient, in the East, okay, not in the West, not in Asia, not in China, not Japan, but from the East. This is from their traditions, their oral traditions, their writings, they all point to the East, okay? If you want to know where people come from, you ask their elders, you ask, you, you go through their writings, you go through their oral traditions, not from an outside source you go direct you go within the ancient writings of the people it says that the first commonality is that they both claim to have come to the americas from across the sea from the east towards the rising sun as the shawnee that's one the sock that's two the uruk they all teach this all their ancient teachings point to the east that's where they that's where they say they come from Concerning the Olmec, the Spanish friar, uh, the friar Diego de Inglanda said that some old men of Yucatan said that they 
heard from their ancestors that this country was peopled by a certain race who came from the east, who God delivered by opening for, for them 12 roads through the sea, which sounds just like 2nd Esbrus, the 13th chapter, verses 40 through 48. Okay? Don't stop at verse 45. You go all the way to 48. And we're going to touch on that later. This means that the Olmecs came to Mexico in 12 ways of immigrants. And that's from the book, The First Americans Were Africans, documented evidence by David M. Hotep. And he's a Ph.D. And we know that word Africa is not really a nationality. Africa is a continent. It's, a, uh, it's really a pseudonym. It's not a real nationality. But our people use it so, you know, for the layman's sake, so to speak. Let's keep going. Again, another source. Voyages of the Phoenicians. Diodorus Siculus relates that the Phoenicians discovered a large island in the Atlantic Ocean beyond the Pillars of Hercules. Several days journey from the coast of Africa. This island abounded in all manners of riches. The, so the soil was exceedingly fertile. The scenery was diversified by rivers, mountains, and forests. It was the custom of the inhabitants to retire during the summer to, to the magnificent country houses which stood in the midst of the beautiful gardens. Fish and game were found in great abundance. The climate was delicious and the trees bore fruit at all seasons of the year. Now, I'm going to stop right there. This sounds like an island in the Circum Caribbean. You can just pick one. It sounds like Puerto Rico. It sounds like uh, Dominican. It sound, the Dominican Republic, what we call that now, okay, uh, Santiago. It sounds like the Bahamas. Take your pick. It sounds like Aruba. Let's keep reading. The Phoenicians discovered this fortunate island by accident, being driven on its coast by contrary winds. On their return, they gave glowing accounts of its beauty and fertility. And the Tyrians, letting you know that these are two separate people, the Tyrians are Hamites. These Phoenicians are the Carthaginians, are Israelites. Watch what they do to the Tyrians, who were also noted sailors, desired to colonize it. But the Senate of Carthage opposed their plan. If they're the same people, why would they oppose their plan? Because we know Carthage has Hebraic, Aramaic roots. Our people have a history with Carthage. That's why you got Hannibal Barkai, okay? And you have all those Hebrew writings you find over there in Carthage. On the graves, so on and so forth. Okay, you can get a book uh, by Rudolf Windsor from T Babylon to Timbuktu, and he brings that out about the tribes of Zebulun and Asher within Carthage. Okay? Now, that's clear proof right there. He didn't want, they didn't want the Tyrians to do anything with the new land. So we know this is evidence that Hamites wasn't coming over here at first. It was all Israelite territory. Now, let's read on. It says, but the Sinite of Carthage opposed their plan either through jealousy and a wish to keep any commercial benefit that they might be derived from it for themselves or as Diodorus relates because they wish to use it as a place of refuge in case of necessity. That's exactly why we went to Arsaroof. That's exactly why we left the Middle East and left all those lands because we wanted to get far away from other people. That's ref when we were seeking refuge. We weren't trying to be close to any other nation. The only thing that fits that criteria is the Americas. There's no other land during that time that fits that criteria. The whole world, no world at that time, was populated by people. Yes, even Africa. Even Africa. Europe, all of it. We know this through the annals of history, the records. Okay. But let's keep going on. Next slide. And I'm only on the fourth slide, people, but here we go. It says Africa at the top, as you can see. You can see to the right the Jews of Algiers. You can see they're clearly depicted as dark-skinned people. We understand that. Before we mix, before we uh, ran into this devil to Esau, like he went, he goes everywhere popping his seed and he changed the color of the people. We understand it. That doesn't mean there's no original people left. But you can see to the right the Jews of Algiers being depicted as dark people. But to the left, this is what we want to focus on. It says the North African jewelry possibly goes back to the time when the Tyrians and the Sidonites uh, settled on the African coast. Because you, you, you guys are going to understand history. When the Assyrians sacked Israel, they also sacked um, Sidon and Tyre. Because those were our neighboring 
uh, neighboring countries, right? And once they got sacked, they fled the, the, the sea coast. A lot of them fled and went down into the coast, of the African coast, the northern coast. Uh, and this is from J.W. Herxberg, A History of the Jews in North Africa, okay? And we were intermixed within that uh, migration. That's what J.W. Herxberg is getting to. Next slide. Proofs. Ezekiel 30, verse 5. Ethiopia, which Ethiopia can talk about Kush. It can talk about the uh, the Babylonian Empire. It also talks about, it also encompasses Africa. Because Africa for a time was called, known as Upper and Lower Ethiopia. Okay? Understand that. It says Ethiopia and Libya. Uh, syntax error right there. Should be an A-N-D, not an A-M-D. Ethiopia and Libya. And all the mingle people, because those Libya and those lands, Numidia and stuff like that, North Africa, was known to be mingled. And we were part of that populace. Here's the proof. Jason of Cyrene. Who's Jason of Cyrene? He composed the five books of Maccabees and condensed it into two. His name is Jason of Cyrene. And where is Cyrene? Cyrene is in North Africa, right next to Libya. Second Maccabees 2, 1932, for the proof, for the record. You can go back and check that source. Lucius of Cyrene, he's mentioned where? In the New Testament, Acts 13 and 1. Letting you know our people had a, had a posterity in these lands for a long period of time. Jason of Cyrene is around the 3rd century uh, B.C. And Lucius of Cyrene is around the 1st century A.D. The Libyan Jews, um, that's Acts 2 and 10, where when they had Pentecost, they were talking about the Jews in Libya. In the Antiquities of the Jews, book 16, chapter 9, the Jews in Asia and all those of the same nation which live in Libya. These are all 3rd century sources. This is from the Josephus. Okay? So we have a rich history in North Africa. Okay? It says Hannibal Barkai, where is he? Uh, the General Carthage, uh, which we know he had a Hebraic background. Eldad Denai reports Zebulun Ash in Africa, now in the 9th century A.D., but you can see that the posterity from those relations that go back thousands of years prior to that. Septimius Severus is in his Punic origins of Tripoli, which is also in North Africa. So you can see it was all over that coast. Let's keep going. And you can see to the right the a map of uh, Car Carthaginian rule. Um, it says none, they mean anywhere. Remember, I'm just putting that Spanish up there just because. But let's get to the source. It says, amongst the Indians of North America, there is a very general legend that their forefathers came from a land toward the sun rising. What does it mean there's a general legend? I mean, that's the general consensus amongst the Native American people, amongst their ancient people. The Iowa and the Dakota Indians, according to Major J. Lynn, believe that all tribes in the Indians were formerly one and dwelt together on an island towards the sunrise. They crossed the sea from thence in huge skiffs or boats in which the Dakotas of the old floated for weeks, finally gaining dry land. This history matches with what Diodorus Sikula says. This history matches what 2nd Ezra says, Isaiah says, Jeremiah, the, uh, the Psalms. This all matches the history, the biblical records, the historical records. So you Negroes are being adverse for no reason. Okay, you're trying to go against this for no reason. It's come. It's time to come to the truth. And I'm really not making it for the scoffers. I'm making this video for the brothers and sisters that might be out there, might be uh, deterred, uh, deferred by the the opposition and their claims, their erroneous claims. Because we have history, we have sources that can back up the 12 tribe charts. We have history, we have sources to prove that the Israelites came to the Americas and settled it before any other uh, other people. Okay? It says, They sailed to America from the East, The Story of Atlantis and the Lost Lemuria by William Scott Elliot, page 13. This is where I got that source. Their Origins. You can see the source. It says, Shawnee Tradition of Indian Origin from Indian Tribes in the United States by Henry R. Schoolcraft, 1847, uh, chapter 4, page 255. The Shawnees lived in the western Ohio and mingled with the Miamis and Delaware of Indian, Indiana. They had a tradition of having crossed a great sea in annu annually for many years off of sacrifices for their safe deliverance. 
The following story is the char characteristic of a class of stories of creation common to these Western Indians. All of them believe this. All of them understand this. All of them know knew this. Readings in Indiana History by Indiana State Teachers Association History Section, page 30. Gad wasn't completely destroyed or completely, you know, um, defeated until 1891. So a lot of his history has been still retained through those, to, through those elders. But let's keep going. Aztec source, right? Quetzalcoatl, if you don't know who Quetzalcoatl is, a federal servant, he's uh, personified as a pet feather serpent and represented by a feather serpent to come save the Aztec or Mexica, which Mexica is Hebrew for anointed. Okay? It's not Mexico, it's Mexica. Either rate, let's go. Twesicoto was was said to have prophesied his return to his people across the eastern ocean. The Spaniards who had their attendance, the lightness were flesh. But they understood that what? Quetzalcoatl was said to have prophesied his return to his people across the eastern ocean. And this is from the prehistory of America in the Pacific Ocean, page 366. And that's the legend. And I, I basically, this was supposed to go into my book I was working on, but I wanted to release this for this video because I'm bringing this information to uplift and exhort our people, the Nordic Kingdom, the Native Americans, the Hispanics, the Latinos, which come from the word Ladino, which is an, um, an endonym for what? For people that speak Spanish and Hebrew. And it's funny they got that name. But anyway, let's get to this source. It says, uh, Hopalon, the Mexica, the ancient Mexican, the ancient Aztecs believe they came from, and no, actually understood they came from the land Hopalon, which is in the east. Now, let's see what this word Hopalon means when it's broken down in the Hebrew. The land of prayer. And that's what we consider Jerusalem, a land of prayer. It says hi. Ha is the article D. Palau means prayers. Strong's H6419 and Lan meaning land. No other suffix for location. So the land of prayer. That's what Hapala, Hapalan means. Hapalan is the land of ancient Mexicans claimed descent from across the sea towards the east. Isaiah 56 verse 7. Even then will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. The land of prayer is Jerusalem. The Native Americans are descendants of the ten tribes, and many of their origin stories point back to Israel. Quetzalcoatl and Kukulkan. Let's talk about this real quick. They are known as feathered serpents, right? Can we find that in the Bible? Yes, yes indeed. True indeed. Seraph meaning serpent. Strong's H8314. So you, brother, so you brothers and the viewers at home can actually go back and research this yourselves. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 2 and then we're going to jump to verse 6 to 7 it says above it stood the seraphims each one had six wings seraphims just means serpent okay so six wings feathered serpents there you go that's Quetzalcoatl and Kukulkan in the Bible with twain he covered his face and one with twain he covered his feet and with twain he did fly then flew one of the seraphims unto me having a live coal in his hand which he had taken with the tongues from off the altar and he laid it upon my mouth and said lo this hath touched thy lips and thy iniquity is taken away and thy sin is purged so they only they believe this because this is biblical Isaiah dealt with these feathered creatures the Aztec and Mayan belief that a serpent messiah like creature would return to heal them this is a clear parallel of the account in the book of Isaiah you see it's deeper than rap you people don't understand how deep this goes. We can prove without no shadow of a doubt that the so-called Hispanics of Indian and Negro descent are Israelites. That the North American Indians are Israelites. The Canadian First Nation Indians are Israelites. You have to be completely oblivious not to get this. This tribe is rich with history due to the abundance of information recorded by the ancient Aztecs and Mayans. Judges 5 verse 14. And out of Zebulun, they that handled the pen of the writer. For example, so Zebulun was known for handling the pen of the writer. Can we find that trait within the Native Americans? Yes, we can. It says, for example, the Kamal Kalko 
bricks with the various languages in the fashion of a codex containing Phoenician. Listen to this. These Kamakau bricks that were found in Central America, they contain this in it. Phoenician? What we were bringing out earlier, the Carthaginian history. Why does it have Phoenician? Because we spoke that language. Egyptian? Why does it say Egyptian? Because guess what? We were in Egypt. Why does it say Libyan? Guess what? We were in Libya. And Mende. Why does it say Mende? Because we have ties with those people. Because those are our people in West Africa. The Mende people or the Mandikas as you, as you know them. Zebulon were known for the recording skills all the way back to the time of the judges. The Mayan retained their traits from their progenitor, Zebulon or Zebulon. If you know anything about the history of Zebulon and the pantheon of gods and how they how those structures work, they have a, a god or an ancestor named Zebulon. This is recorded proof. This is not hidden or obscure. You can actually look this stuff up. Aztecs is of Hebrew derivation. Oz meaning time, Strong's H227. Tech meaning in camp or gathering, Strong's 8497. The Nato world word for people of. Aztec, people of time. That's what that word means. And when you go to the scripture, which I have written here, this name fits the prophecy according to 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32. And of the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. So their name reflects the prophecy of, of, the, of their nation to have an understanding of time. Aztec means the people of time. The heads of them were 200 and all their brethren were at their commandment. Aztec and Mayan calendars have been regarded as being more accurate than the Gregorian calendar. The Hob the Mayan calendar contains the image of the year bearer hunched over with the stones of times on his back. Because we always associate those native Indians with time. Why? Because they're the tribes of Issachar and Zebulon. Which we would trade our skills with, within each other. They would give us their recording skills. We would give them our time bearing skills. The, it, and that's according to Deuteronomy 33 account that we would dwell in the same tense. This image reflects on how the tribe of Issachar are... Owashakak, Owashakar, Owashaka, Owashaka, Mexico, that's the name Issachar within that uh, uh, structure, was responsible for keeping up with the discerning with, with discerning times. And you can see Oshaka, that's called a metathesis, when words change and you change different words, the sounding of words. But it, the original name is Issachar, or what we call today Issachar, that's the English tongue speaking, okay, but they called it Owashakar. Next slide. And this is from Christopher, uh, I mean, The Lost Cities of North Central America by David Hatcher Childress, page 416. And this is about Christopher Columbus. Okay. It says, Peter Martyr wrote in 1511 that after Columbus discovered abandoned gold mines on the island of Haiti or Espanola, he believed it to be the land of Ophir. Columbus himself wrote that he had taken into possession for the Spanish majesties Mount Soporo, Mount Ophir, which it took King Solomon's ship three years to reach. Here we see that it was Columbus' belief that the gold mines on Haiti were believed to have been worked by ancient Jewish and Phoenician seafarers. And Columbus named the mountain after the biblical Ophir. This is history. Columbus didn't think he was going to no damn Chinatown. Are you serious? In his excellent book on forgotten places and old maps, no longer on the map, the historian Raymond H. Ramsey says that Colombia's son Bartolome confirms the identification of Espanola and that his father believed himself to have found the land of Ophir, from which King Solomon's ships had fetched gold for the holy temple in Jerusalem. Ramsey keeps that this Conjecture of ancient Jewish and Phoenician seafarers of the Caribbean circle of 1000 BC by Columbus is of special interest to all the students of American history. No, some of them. No, all of them. Columbus' own conjecture is the first post Columbian theory of a pre Columbian discovery of America. By his own conjecture, by his own sentiments, he even admitted that he wasn't the first one. But we have a day called Columbus Day, and we, you know, it's in the, it's in the, uh, the textbooks that our kids are, are force fed and shoved down their throat that he discovered America. But even he understood he wasn't the first one. 
Reading on, Columbus was in possession of several maps which showed large portions of North and South America, even parts of Antarctica. The famous Piri Reis map states in the legend that is, it is redrawn from other charts, including maps once used by Columbus. This map is now at the top Kaki Museum in Istanbul, and it testifies that the Atlantic was being navigated long before the European Dark Ages. I'm going to have to pause right here because Negroes will read stuff like this or come across this and they'll never register in their mind that this place was discovered before America. Even though people are here, even though they had naval skills, even though they had ships far superior, okay, and ca more capable than enough to go across the seas. But that's for another video. Let me read on. Dating from 513, the Piri Reis map shows the entirety of the west coast of North and South America plus a good portion of Antarctica. Just a few years after Columbus made his first voyage to the New World, this map's strangest aspect is that it ac accurately shows the details of Antarctica landmass which are today covered with ice, which we have only known were accurate for the last few years. That means these maps were in existence pre-Columbian. How could it come with that detail? Meaning you had surveyors, somebody had to go out there and know this land and draw it. Says the Turkish Admiral Pierre Reis in the handbook for sailors called the Kitab uh, Barrier. Barrie. Um, Columbus was inspired by a book containing information about these lands, which were claimed to be rich in all sorts of minerals and gems. This man Columbus tried with the book in his hand to convince the Portuguese and Genoese that an expedition would be very worthwhile. His ideas were rejected, and so he turned to the Spanish Bay. Here, to first request was not. Here, his first request was not granted, but was later on accepted after the matter had been pressed. And what was the book which Columbus was in possession of? Admiral Piri Reis tells us that the book was Imago Mundi by French Cardinal Pierre de Aile, Aile also known as Aliaco or Petrus Aliacus a philosopher, astrologist, and cosmo cosmographer, okay, and that's the end of the source, but you can see that's a lot of meat in there explaining Columbus coming over here calling uh, the, the, the mountains, the mining uh, mountains of uh, Haiti, um, Ophir, because they were already mined before he got there, and making that connection, showing that he knew he wasn't the first person over here, going into how he came over here, discovering these maps that were fully detailed on Antarctica, and how could they be when we just figured this stuff out, supposedly, air quotations needed. Um, but let's continue on. This is uh, Izumna, the Izumna glyph, and it, and it goes into the origin of the central Indians again. Quote, unquote, Indians, because they're not Indians, they are Israelites according to the Bible. I'm just saying it for your understanding. But anyway, at any rate, this glyph shows or details how they came over here to the Americas by the way of ships, by the way of sea. All right, let's get into these Bible verses. It's uh, the book of Psalms, chapter 80, verse 6. She sent out her bowls unto the sea and her branches unto the river. According to verse 1, Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh is being referred to here. Uh, for all the people that's going to get slick, oh, the Israelites didn't know nothing about uh, maritime stuff and seafaring. No, that's beyond them. Even though when you read the book of uh, Ezekiel, I believe was it's 27 chapter, the chapter is talking about Tyre and Zidon and how they trade. They said Judah was in, within that merch, you know, uh, ship merchant merchandise trading by the way of ships. And Dan would travel to um, um, Greece, what we know as Greece, Javan between Javan by ships, but we didn't know anything about ships. Come on now. That's back in Ezekiel's time. You know, you talk you talking uh what, seven? No, Isaiah's the oldest, so about six sixth century. Jo uh, Jonah is eighth, ninth century. So we're gonna go to Jonah. The book of Jonah, chapter one, verse three. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa, which is in the land of Israel, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. Wait, I thought we didn't know nothing about seafaring or traveling or doing anything like that. How did Jonah do this? So he paid, it was a job in the land of Israel. We understood ships. We understood seafaring and maritime uh, development. 
So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it. We go to, with them unto Tarsus from the presence of the Lord. It's ninth to eighth century uh, uh, account. And this account lets the reader know that the Israelites were familiar with maritime travel. This wasn't a foreign concept. It's not too far fetched. Chile, or Chile. Uh, that's read Deuteronomy 33, verse 17. His glory is like the first thing of his bullock, and his horns are like the horns of unicorns. And unicorn is just a word signifying a rhinoceros. Okay, it's not talking about a mythical cre creature. This is a real creature, a rhinoceros. And the unicorn horns represented um, the small horn, like a rhinoceros. You look, it has a small horn, then it has a big horn. The small horn will represent Manasseh, and the big horn will represent Ephraim. Okay, with them he shall push the people towards the ends of the earth. The power and the might that Ephraim had ac uh, accomplished after he, they grant they were granted amnesty by King Cyrus. You got to understand that they were granted amnesty from Assyria and they were free. They gained they gained might. Carthage, they were known as a mighty uh, empire. Okay, put two and two together. After they gained that might, they, they used that power and influence and riches to push their people to the ends of the earth. Not Africa, not the middle of the earth, not north of the earth, the end. And they, and that's the Americas. The Americas is the ends of the earth. And they are the ten thousands of Ephraim and they are the thousands of Manasseh. The Mapuche word, a Mapuche is a quote-unquote Indian tribe. Chile translates to the end of the earth. That's why I don't argue with the YouTube commenters. Because they don't come with anything solid. They come with feelings. They come with rhetoric. I'm here to educate, exhort, and uplift my people. I'm not here to bicker with somebody because they have a disagreement just because they don't like it. Next slide. Uh, y didn't, I, I know y'all didn't see this coming. This is St. Clement. This is within his works, within his writings. Okay. St. Clement even said it, right, which was a brother. Clement chapter 20. The ocean impassable to men, meaning, oh, man, you just can't walk in the ocean or you can't, you, you can try to swim for miles, but, uh, you know, let's see how that works. And the worlds beyond it. He understood there was worlds and habitations, people living there, beyond the sea are regulated by the same enactments of the Lord, meaning the Lord rules over there as well. The same commandments are over there. Okay? Clement understood this. Was it like 2nd century AD source? And I got to the right image of the pillars of Hercules because we surpassed the pillars of Hercules, which is in the edge of Africa. Uh, I put far here, Nehemiah 1, 8-9. Remember, I beseech thee the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nation. But if you turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though there were of you cast out unto the othermost part of the heaven, yet would I gather them from thence and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. Israel was scattered abroad. We even went to the othermost part of the heaven, which is what? America, not Africa, not Turkey, not Istanbul. Well, even though our people are all those places, but did, in, in the context of Second Ezra, it's not talking about none of those places. That's the thing. We left all those places to get away from the other nations, not get close to them, not live next to them, but to get completely away, be completely isolated from any outside influences. The only place that fits that criteria or description is America the Americas okay and not all of the northern kingdom left that's not what we teach and we're going to get into that the scripture doesn't say that uh, next slide first Chronicles 20 verses 35 to 36 and after this did Jehoshaphat king of Judah join himself with ah ah Ahaziah king of Israel who did very wickedly and he joined himself with him to make ships to go to Tarshish. And they made the ships in Aslan Gibber, which you can see right there. Where is that? On the coast of the Sinai. I mean, on the coast of Saudi, what we know as Saudi Arabia today. Right there. That's where we made those ships. The Gulf of Aqaba. Right? 
So we had ship ports. We understood how this worked. We read earlier about the ship ports in uh, Jabo. Now we're reading about the ship ports in Ebzon Geber. Make the ships there. Whoop de do. Next slide. The infamous scripture that nobody wants to really give credence to. Uh, that's on the uh, opposite side. It doesn't want to agree that our brothers and sisters are the Hispanics and Native Indians. Uh, 2nd Ezra 13, verses 40 to 48. Those are the ten tribes which were carried away prisoners out of their own land in the time of Osea, the king, whom Salamanzar, the king of Assyria, led away captive, and he carried them over the waters, and so came into the other land. And we know that wasn't all the uh, northern kingdom as well, which I'm going to do another video. I think it was like 22,000 he took, but they took it, you know, it was like multiple trips, but I believe Sargon II said he took, he accounted 22,000. A lot of the Nordic kingdoms stayed back even then, okay? You read about that in the Book of Kings and Chronicles, how they would make different forts for Ephraim and uh, Manasseh would come to the Passover even after this happened, okay? After the king Hezekiah, his sons, Josiah, that was after, Josiah is after, after the expulsion of the Nordic kingdom out of that land. But you still have Israelites coming to the Passover. That means some of them were still protected by the southern kingdom. This is what has been looked over and a lot of our people don't touch on. But I'm going to make a video dedicated uh, to that. It's going to be named um, Those That Be Left Behind. It's going to be very educational, very insightful. Look out for that family. But let's continue to read. But they took this counsel. It says, Assyria led them away captive, he carried them over the waters, and so they came into another land, which is Assyria. But they took this counsel among themselves that they would leave the multitude of the heathen and go forth into a further country where never mankind dwelt. Never mankind dwelt. Let's see. Africa has a long history of men dwelling there. When it was called Upper and Lower Ethiopia, it has a long history. Okay, the Sioux tribe, they claim to be in Africa for a long period of time. They actually claim to be the first, okay? <laughs> you can look that up. Um, I believe they're the Sioux. I could be getting their name wrong. It starts with an S. Uh, the Japhites have been, the Etruscans and all that, they claim right for uh, Europe, okay? They claim the right for Europe. Magog and all that, they claim right for Russia. In the Middle East, we know, we know that place has always been inhabited. So why, what is this talking about? Okay? What is this talking This is talking about, it can only be talking about the Americas, the uninhabited land. That they might keep, there keep their statues, which they never kept in their own land. That's the attention. We know a lot of them fell off, like a lot of our people fell off all over the planet. That's why we we went into slavery. Come on now. And they entered into Euphrates by a narrow place of the river. For the Most High then showed signs to them and held still the flood till they were passed over. For through that country there was a great way to go. Namely, of a year and a half, in the same region is called Arsareth. Okay, meaning another land. Then dwelt they there until the latter time. Now they should begin to come. The highest shall stay the springs of the stream again, that they may go through. Therefore saw the multitude with peace. So this happened on a multitude of occasions of them traveling out of Assyria, coming back to the land of Israel, and then regrouping and then leaving. Okay, Zechariah gives a more detailed account. But those, because they it says they took counsel um, and they didn't want to stay, so they left. When you read Zechariah, but those that be left behind of thy people are they that are found within my borders, because you had a lot of the northern kingdom that just want to stay within the borders of Israel. Okay, that's why when you go to the New Testament, you have Annas of the tribe of Asher. You have the Samarian woman. Okay. You had uh, you have uh, Acts the Acts account of the brother that was given um, Cornelius the brother that was given his alms, okay to the nation why because he understood those were his brothers he was from the northern kingdom he was he was the, he's the posterity of those brothers that were left in the borders of Israel that didn't take this voyage to another land uh, to a land where never mankind dwelt they didn't take this voyage to the Americas some did in fact stay. Next slide. And it says Ken in Spanish means who, right? Uh, this is a, from a Assyrian relief. At the bottom, you see the name of the temple. It's the Koyunik. 
I'm just trying to pronounce it the best way I can. Uh, temple, uh, bas relief, or the base relief. And this is a captive, a Syrian captive, and you can see the garb is clearly reminiscent of that of a Native American. Okay, that's where they went to. This is how they dress. They dress like this back. The, fe the everybody knows as a historian, those feathers go back to the Middle East. That is a Middle Eastern regalia, right? That wearing the feathers. Um, you can see it clearly here. So with with this slide, I'm actually going to end the presentation. As you can see, without a shadow of doubt, there should be no more, you know, debunkles or debates about this. But I know they're going to come anyway because good is set against evil. Everything doubled against each other. You're going to have people that goes against everything. You know, they're going to be combating against the truth, uh, combating against their own people, turning their own flesh. But we're here to enlighten those that want to learn and uplift and exhort those that want to know the knowledge. As you can see, the presentation, presentation shows you that the Native Americans come from ancient Israel. They are Israelites. Okay. They are the northern kingdom of Israel. Not all of the Northern Kingdom came over here, but the populace of this of ancient America consisted of the Northern Kingdom. And with that, I am going to say shalom. Stay tuned for the next one. It's going to be a goodie.